Hi, I'm Mark Golub. And a number of years back, we were all a bit younger and JBS was still called Shalom TV. We created a Hebrew series that became one of our most popular programs called From the Aleph Bet, a series to teach anyone of any age how to read and pronounce any Hebrew word and better still, to understand Hebrew words that are used in the experience of Judaism. We're very pleased to be able to repeat it for those of you who may never have seen it before and have always wanted to learn to read Hebrew. So here then is another lesson in our series from the Aleph Bet. I hope you enjoy it. Aleph Bet Bet Gimel Dalit Hey Bav Zayn Chet Tet Yud Kav Chav Lamed Men Nun Zamech Ha'in Pei Fet Zadi Kuf Reish Shun Sen Tav Now I think I've said enough Welcome my friends to Shalom TV's series on learning Hebrew entitled From the Aleph Bet. I'm Mark Golub. It's my privilege to host this series and I'm very, very excited about what we're going to try to do on Shalom TV through the program From the Aleph Bet. First of all, the title From the Aleph Bet is meant to suggest we're starting from the beginning. Aleph and Bet are the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet and we are beginning from number one, lesson number one, for anybody who doesn't even know the Hebrew alphabet. And I should speak for one moment about for whom this series has been designed. And I should say parenthetically, if you've got pen and paper, pencil nearby, you can put it aside for this session. This is not lesson one. This is an introduction to what we hope this series will be doing. And I want to talk first about who we're intending this series to be for. Uh, first, it's for people of any age. I've had the joy of teaching Hebrew for some 40 years. People of all ages, children, young people who are becoming bar bat mitzvah, and adults who have also often come to me and said they've had a hard time learning Hebrew. Could they is there any way in which the Hebrew language could be made simple? Could it be made easy to learn? And hopefully what you're going to see here on Shalom TV is something for anyone who wants to learn Hebrew, even for someone who has had difficulty learning languages in the past. And for all of us, there are differing degrees of comfort with foreign languages. And there are those people who they can open up a book and in three days, let alone three weeks, they seem to be comfortable with the language, fluent, able to read, able to speak. And then there are many of us for whom language is a struggle. And one of the things I want for you is a place in which you can learn Hebrew easily and simply. And I think if you stay with us for the sessions that are upcoming, you will find that the Hebrew language will be very, very easy for you to learn. I also want to encourage people of all ages to watch this series. There are very few places where parents and grandparents have the opportunity to study something with children or grandchildren together. This series will give you that opportunity. So whether you're a young person or whether you're someone older, this is a place for you to have an opportunity to study Hebrew and to learn Hebrew easily. The next question is, what does it mean to learn Hebrew? And what do we hope to achieve in this series? For most of us, what it means to learn to be able to read Hebrew, for most of us it means being able to open up a page of Hebrew, a Siddur, a prayer book, or the Torah itself, and be able to follow as someone else does the reading, or to be able to pronounce the words on the page. Hebrew is a foreign alphabet. One of the things we have to learn is what the letters, how the letters are pronounced, how words are put together. And so very often the term read Hebrew refers to being able to pronounce Hebrew. And that's the first thing we hope to be able to help you do 
through this series. We want you to be able to look at any Hebrew word, be able to pronounce it, and hopefully as you hear someone else reading Hebrew, to be able to follow along as that Hebrew is being read. But I want more for you than simply being able to pronounce Hebrew. I also want you to be able to read Hebrew as a language. I want it to mean something to you cognitively as well. And so one of the things we're going to stress as we go along is simple, basic Hebrew vocabulary, especially the vocabulary that we use here as American Jews. And it reminds me to also say that if there are those of you who are not Jewish, who are watching Shalom TV's program right now from the Aleph Bet, and you've wanted to learn Hebrew, not only will this series teach you the Hebrew alphabet and how to pronounce Hebrew words, but you too will learn some of the basic Hebrew vocabulary that American Jews use in their daily expression and experience with Judaism. What we're not doing is learning how to speak conversational Hebrew. And there will be other series that we present to you on Shalom TV that hopefully will help you with conversational Hebrew, the kind of Hebrew you might speak if you were to visit the state of Israel. But this series is not about conversational Hebrew. It's about being able to learn, to recognize Hebrew words, to be able to pronounce them, to be able to follow along as somebody else reads Hebrew, and to learn vocabulary that applies to the way Jews experience and live their Jewish life in Hebrew here in America. And I want to give you an example of what it means to really begin to learn Hebrew as a language. I want to put a picture up on the screen with an English word below it. It's a word and a picture you all know. Here you see a picture of a king. For me, by the way, I tend to see a king's face more than a king's body. This almost looks like a king out of a Shakespeare play. But be that as it, as it is, every one of us has in our own minds a visual image when we say the English word king. Close your eyes for a moment and say the word king. Some image comes to your mind. If it's not exactly the one on the screen, it's one like it. Hebrew becomes a language for you when the word king evokes an image and the same image is evoked when you hear or see the Hebrew word melech. Hebrew becomes a language for you when the word king in English and the word melech in Hebrew evoke the same mental picture. For many of us, who went through the typical Talmud Torah process. It wasn't taught to us that way. Even if we were taught the word melech, very often all we saw what was the English letters K-I-N-G. And when I was young, melech did not evoke in my mind the picture of a king. It evoked instead the English letters K-I-N-G. And what I'm hoping is that for those of you who want to study Hebrew and learn Hebrew, you will not see, when you hear the word melech, K-I-N-G, you will see that picture. That's melech for you. From now on, that will be melech. Anytime you hear the word or recite the word, melech will be what you see in your mind, similar to the picture on the screen. I want to do the same thing with another word. Any time you hear or see the word lechem, it means what you see on the screen. It doesn't mean bread. It means what you see on the screen. And for any of you, there is an image you have in your mind, in your being, whenever you use the word bread in English. The same image, the same feeling you have about bread, some feeling about bread, even better, some feeling about bread should come to you whenever you see or hear the word lechem. Lechem is that. And it's more important for you to feel lechem is that which you see on the screen 
than saying to yourself, lechem altsi, how do you translate lechem? Oh, it's bread. No, no, it's not bread. It's whatever that is on the screen. That's lechem. One more time, I want to show you what melech means. That's melech. And one more time, this is what lechem means. That's lechem. And what I hope to do for all of you as we learn Hebrew together is not only teach you how to pronounce the word lechem with the Hebrew letters lamed, chet, and mem, but I also want you to become comfortable with what these words mean. And all of a sudden, Hebrew will have a much more powerful presence in your life. And there's one minor caveat, and because I don't want to be misunderstood, I want to take one more moment in this introduction to our session on learning Hebrew to make sure I am not being misunderstood about one nuance of what I'm saying. Some people are, how shall I say it, they are not critical, but they are condescending to individuals who can only pronounce Hebrew. I'm stressing for you that it's important to learn it as a language. And language means that certain Hebrew words will evoke images in one's mind. But I don't want to suggest to anyone that if an individual can pronounce Hebrew, can look at a Hebrew page, can hear Hebrew recited, can follow along as somebody else is reading Hebrew, even if they don't know what these words mean, I am not suggesting that being able to pronounce Hebrew is valueless. To the contrary, for most Jews, especially outside the state of Israel, much of what Hebrew they read, meaning pronounce, is Hebrew they do not know the translation of. But it has an enormous importance in their life, and it has an enormous, uh, enormous power in terms of Jewish identity. And it is of enormous value simply for an individual to be able to recognize Hebrew words, pronounce Hebrew words, read Hebrew in the sense of being able to pronounce even if they don't know what these words mean. And the reason is because Hebrew is the music, the sound. It is the eternal music and sound of the Jewish people. It's the sound that links every individual Jew to every other Jew, no matter where that Jew lives in the world. And it links the American Jew, not only to the Israeli Jew, but to the Jew who lives in Spain and France and Italy and South American countries and to China and Japan. Anywhere Hebrew is spoken, regardless of what the vernacular is, Jews are linked by that language. And I've had the, you know, the, the wonderful opportunity to travel to foreign countries with my wife. And our most recent trip was to Italy. And on Shabbat, we visit the great synagogue of Rome. It was just a magnificent, I, I get goose pimples even thinking about it. We're sitting in, in the great synagogue in Rome. She's upstairs with the women. I'm downstairs with the men. And everybody around me, very few people in that room spoke English, but they all were bonded together, bound together, united in the liturgy of the Jewish prayer, which is in the Hebrew language. And when one hears the sound of certain prayers, certain brachot, certain blessings, one feels at home. I was at home in that great synagogue in Rome because of the Hebrew language and because of the people I was sitting with. And there are key, central, fundamental prayers, statements that Jews make, which have wonderful meaning in English. There's no notion in the Jewish tradition that God is limited to the Hebrew language. Any language that one can speak, one can utter, even a silent language, in some wondrous way, whatever God there is in this universe, that God hears prayers, any language. But the Jewish people's way of expressing themselves, both in prayer and in study 
and in day-to-day -day life has been Hebrew. And there is something called the Shema. The Shema is the most important single sentence in the Jewish tradition. And again, if there are some of you who are not Jewish who are watching right now, you should know Jewish children are taught the Shema as soon as they are able to understand. The Shema is the, is the essence of Jewish existence. Can we put the Shema, by the way, up on the screen? This is the Shema in Hebrew, in, in the Hebrew language. And the words read, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And in English, those words mean, Hear, O Israel, in the sense of, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is the line that is taught to young children as soon as they are able to learn anything. It's the line that is said as one goes to sleep at night. It's a line, according to the Jewish tradition, that should be said when one awakes in the morning. And in the history of the Jewish people, it is the Shema which has been used if one knows one is at the end of one's life. It's the last sentence of Jewish identity and of, in some way, faith in eternity that the Jew utters. It has been, unfortunately, the statement that has been on the lips of Jewish martyrs throughout Jewish history. But it's not a statement that one should associate with the end of life as much as it is the statement of everyday existence. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And even if there are Jews who couldn't tell you what each word in that Shema means, to be able to see it on the screen, to be able to hear it recited, to be able to see it on a page and feel comfortable with it, to feel that it belongs to the individual seeing it or reading it or hearing it, it's the most important thing one can do in terms of strengthening Jewish identity and a bond with Jews all over the world. And it is also the Hebrew language typified by this Shema, which links every Jew living today with every Jew who has ever walked this earth, with all the generations the parents and the grandparents and the great-grandparents, the great-great-great-grandparents all the way back to Avraham Avinu in some wondrous symbolic way. It is the Hebrew language that binds us today with all the generations that have come before us and indeed will link us to all the generations that are yet to come. And if one, if one came to me and said, Mark, what are you trying to do when you're creating on Shalom TV a basic introduction to Hebrew class, course, series? I would say my goal is simple. Anybody who watches this series should come away comfortable with Hebrew to the extent that they feel that they can share it with any Jew anywhere on the face of this earth. And this series will be successful if those of you who are watching week after week become more and more comfortable, A, with the Hebrew sound and the Hebrew language itself, just its sound, and number two, if you'll also be comfortable with some of the key vocabulary that is important to Jewish life here in America today. Anyway, that's what I hope to do with this series from, from the Aleph Bet. And I also want to show you something about Hebrew again in our introduction to the series and it has to do with the way Hebrew words are constructed. Many of us were never taught in Talmud Torah that Hebrew is comprised of three letter roots and that if you begin to learn what these roots are it gives you a clue to what Hebrew words you've never seen mean just by knowing what the root of the word is. And what's nice about knowing Hebrew roots is, if you know Hebrew roots, you begin to understand more, not about the Hebrew language, but about Jewish mentality. Hebrew is not only a way in which Jews share the sound of the Jewish people. Hebrew is also the language which expresses Jewish values. 
And I said earlier that when it comes to, for example, prayer or study of text, it's not that if one doesn't know Hebrew, one is excluded either from prayer or study. But if one does know Hebrew, there is a richness that comes through the Hebrew language which adds to the study or to the liturgy and the prayer. And my point to you is that Jewish values are reflected in the way Hebrew expresses certain words. Ideas are expressed through language and the language gives us a clue as to what the Jewish heart and soul are all about. And I want to give you a couple of simple examples. I want to begin with a root in Hebrew which is kuf dalid shin. And incidentally, Hebrew is read from right to left, English being read from left to right, Hebrew read from right to left, kuf dalid shin. And even if you don't know these letters or you have never seen these letters before, for the moment, understand, reading from right to left, they are kuf, dalid, and shin, the K sound, the D sound, and the sh sound, SH sound in Hebrew. And whenever these three letters come in this order, kuf, dalid, shin, they always have something to do with holiness. And if we take the next word, kadosh, a word many of you have heard often, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. It is the adjective holy from the Hebrew root Kuf Dalet Shin. If you hear the word Mikadesh, as in the phrase Mikadesh HaShabbat, it is again from the Hebrew root Kuf Dalet Shin, and it means one who makes holy. And therefore Mikadesh HaShabbat is one who makes the Sabbath holy. But this is the one I love the most. The Hebrew word for marriage is kiddushin. And if one did not know that it comes from the Hebrew word kadosh, or the Hebrew root kadosh, there would be something missing to the overall meaning of the word marriage in Hebrew. The word marriage in Hebrew is based on the root of holiness. And it suggests in the Jewish tradition the attitude the rabbis had about what marriage is. It is the holiest state in which a man and woman, two human beings, can relate to each other. Kadosh also, the, the root kadosh, kuf dalajin, also has the sense of to separate. And what a man and woman do when they marry is separate the other from all others. And in that sense, holiness means uniqueness. And again, if one does not know that kiddushin is based on the Hebrew root kuf dalet shin, one would never have the, the sense or the insight that is so valuable to understand when one does see the kuf dalet shin inside the word uh, marriage. Give me another root, Jordan. We'll take another root and see how this, this works. Oh, this is one of my favorite Hebrew words, rachamim. For those of you who know Yiddish, you know the word rachmonis. It's basically the same word in Yiddish as rachamim is in Hebrew. And rachamim is all, often translated as mercy. And you see three yellow letters there. Those are the letters that are the Hebrew root of the word mercy, resh, chet, mem. And the question is, what does rachamim really mean? And here we have a problem with language in general. And those of you who, who've studied other languages, French or Spanish, or whether you've studied, studied Latin, you know what I'm about to say from your study in other languages, but it's important to relate it to Hebrew. Each language has its own integrity. And when one translates from one language to another, very often one is trying to approximate what human beings are trying to express in one language and how they'd express it in another language. It's simple when you talk about table. Table in English and shulchan in Hebrew basically convey the same thing. We saw earlier 
Lechem and bread, very similar. Melech and king, pretty similar. And so there are some nouns which in certain languages have nuances that don't have in other languages. In English, we tend to use the word snow to mean anything white that falls from the sky. If one is living in Alaska and is an Eskimo, there are different words for every single type of snow. But in general, nouns are the easiest words to translate from one language to another. The minute one moves away from simple nouns, languages are only approximating what the other language is trying to say in its own vocabulary. And rachamim is a very difficult word to translate into English. Rachamim in Hebrew is often translated in English language prayer books as the word mercy. It's incomplete. The question is, is there a better translation for the word rachamim than the word mercy? And if one knows the root of the word, one begins to have an idea of what that word is trying to convey in the Hebrew language. And my friends, there is a noun that is built on the word rechem that is a part of the human anatomy. Inter interestingly enough, the word rachamim is based on a word that refers to a part of the human body. Based on a part of the human body, Hebrew has, de has developed the word rachamim. And then the question is, what does reish chet mem, which are the three letters that are in the middle of your screen right there, what do the letters reish chet mem mean anatomically in the Hebrew language? My guess is, unless you know, it would be very difficult for you to guess. But I'll give you one moment to let it percolate in your mind. Rechem is part of the body, and it is the essence of the word rachamim, which we tend to translate mercy. Your hint is, it is part of the female anatomy. Reish chet mem is a part of the female anatomy. The actual word is rechem, and lo and behold, Rechem is the word for womb. And if one understands that the Hebrew word rachamim comes from the Hebrew word rechem, one understands that the Hebrew is trying to convey the kind of emotion, the kind of love, and even love is an incomplete word, the kind of emotion that a mother who carries a child inside her body for nine months and then gives birth and very often holds that infant to her breast and nurses this new life, this child, this, this miracle. It is something unique for a mother. And I am not suggesting for one moment that fathers don't love their children. And I, I have five children. I adore my children. I am crazy for my children. I am nuts for my children. Just nuts. I just adore them. And yet I don't need to compete with the love their mother has for them. Their mother's love for my children, Ruth's love for our children is just it's otherworldly. It is divine in a different nature. And I, I, you know, it's not about wanting to be politically correct. I want to be politically correct too. But it's not about being politically correct. It's about I don't want to offend any, any family where the father is taking as much of a parenting role as is possible. I'm not suggesting anything about in any negative way about what it is to be a father. But there is something miraculous about this birth process which a mother understands and which we fathers, men, 
can only stand in awe of. And I have seen birth. I've been in the room and watched birth. I am in awe of what women, mothers, bring into this world. And so it does not surprise me. It's not, there's nothing about this that offends me as a father who's crazy for his children to be able to say to you that when I see a mother cradle a child, when I see the way mothers tend to deal with their children throughout their life, that there is something spectacularly wonderful, uniquely spectacularly wonderful about mother love. And that's what Rachamim is based on. Rachamim isn't mercy. It's the kind of extraordinary, all-encompassing, always forgiving, unconditional love which a mother tends to have for the child this mother has brought into the world. And the genius of the Jewish tradition is that the word rachamim is based on the word rechem. And all I am saying is that it's the way in which Hebrew opens up windows into the Jewish mind and the Jewish soul. We will learn more about the Jewish mentality from Hebrew than we will from an English translation of anything. And one of the things I hope from the Aleph Bed does is begin to sensitize those of you who are watching to the way in which the Hebrew language conveys Jewish values. Jewish values. And there are many other words I could give you. And as we study together some of the vocabulary that we're going to be doing in the series that uh, we call From the Aleph Bet, as we do words that are, in fact, based on interesting insights into the way Hebrew roots relate words to other words, which do not happen in English. The relationships are different. Womb and mercy do not seem to have any connection in the English language. Rechem and Rachamim are intimately related. And that will happen as we go along in general. So as we study Hebrew together, I want to be able to show you the way in which the Hebrew language expresses Jewish values. I hope you enjoyed that lesson of from the Aleph Bet. And remember, you can download lesson sheets and worksheets for every lesson of this series free of charge. Just visit the JBS website homepage at jbstv.org and click on the program icon for From the Aleph Bet. And then click on the very first option, From the Aleph Bet Hebrew Study Sheets. And for anyone who can send JBS a tax-deductible donation of $180 or more, will be pleased to send you the entire 20 program series one of From the Aleph Bet on DVD, complete with a CD of lesson sheets and worksheets. JBS, expanding Jewish understanding, celebrating all things Jewish. Be well, my friends. Aleph Bet, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Tov, Sein, Chet, Tet, Yud, Kof, Chof, Lamed, Mad,